Well, good morning. Good morning. I just want to tell you how much we appreciate being here with you this morning. It's a real privilege. Uh, let's bow our heads for just a moment. We, we, we've been thanking God for what He's doing, and we thank God for what He's doing in, in, in the life of this church. And we ask, Father, right now, this morning, that in every life, in every person, that you would be, continue to do something really special. And Father, we thank you for who you are, thank you. what you are, and we thank you especially for all the wonderful women who are here today who yeah. invest so much of themselves into the lives of so many others. We thank you, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name. Well, it seems like we've had church already, doesn't it? And I'm not, I'm not being facetious when I say that. It's just really good. God is good. He really is. I love what you've done with the place. Seems like last time I was here, it seemed smaller, you know. I don't know. I mean, it's, it, some, you, something you did, the paint or something, but it looks wonderful. God bless you on your uh, increase. And I, I just want to take a few moments uh, if you, to introduce my wife. Carol, would you stand? Would you wave to everyone? <laughs> My wife, Carol, her and I, as, we, as you may know, we've been in the ministry and we've been married together for 43 years and wonderful time in the ministry together. One of the privileges we have is travel and travel to some wonderful places. So what I'm going to take, take just about three minutes of your time. We want to show you last time we were here, we told you that we were going to, be, to the country of Latvia to work as, uh, in, in, in teaching. So we're gonna share just a little bit about that and then we'll come back and jump right into the word. But at the close of the service, I would like to, with your permission, Pastor, I'd like to have everyone grab one of these little prayer reminders because we're headed back to the country of Latvia in September and this will give you something, a point of contact to pray for us. It'll tell you about the ministry we have and we'll be in the back, back there, look for the pretty girl with the things in her hand and uh, take one from her. It'll just be a prayer reminder. So if we're ready, uh, Booth, if you're ready, we'll go. Yes. 
ser mío. He was sharing what was in God's heart. It's kind of hard to kind of pick up on everything. There's so many things there. But one of the things that we, we need you to know is that country of Latvia sits on the Baltic Sea and is a country that was recently, until recently, under the control of, the, of Russia. And as you know, in 1990, they broke that and the Russians left. And they left in place a church that was broken spiritually and broken uh, morally and the whole nine yards. It was just a busted apparatus. But since then, God has begun raising up uh, young people such as you've seen in the video. And our privilege is to go there every year, twice a year, and teach them on evangelism and on just basically being bold in the faith and sharing. The reason for that is because the country, if you follow the news, of Russia has announced that it's coming to retake these uh, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. And when they do, these young people will become underground pastors and underground evangelists. So. And I know when we were here, we shared that with you last time, but it, and God has, has uh, been working in that situation, but they know that without you know, divine intervention, something is going to happen there. So just continue to pray for them and pray for us as we go that we do a great job in helping them get ready for whatever lies ahead for them. And thank you guys for playing a part. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of John. I so appreciate your pastor allowing us to come back year after year. He's a great friend, and he and Mickey are just, they're wonderful people. And, and I really don't mind doing the dishes at their house after we eat, you know, it's, no, I really, it, it, they're a real choice people. But in John chapter 14, verse 11, familiar words, and, uh, and I just want to share what the Lord laid upon my heart several weeks ago as we were uh, communicating back and forth. Believe me, Jesus is speaking, the night before he is put to death, when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, listen carefully to this, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You know, I'm not going to mince words. You and I know we live in a very confused uh, time zone, don't we? I mean, truthfully, you know and I know with the elections going on, getting ready to happen, and all the vitriol and all the hatred that's been spewed out on the political landscape, it's just, you know, it just makes you feel bad. And, but beyond that, you know that there's something below that. It's not just what's happening at that level. In our culture, in America, all over the world, places where we have been, in Europe and in Africa, and even in South and Central America, there's this underlying sense that something is kind of, it's like an underground volcano or underground, uh, just a, a flow of magma that is just pushing and is just, that you sense it, that somewhere along the line, it's going to begin to break through the surface. Now, I know that God is always in control, right? 
Oh, come on, say yes, yeah, right, yeah, okay, there you go. But the reason I say that is, but even with the control of God, I truly believe that we are living in very unique times. We really are. It seems that God has handpicked you and me to live in this time zone, what I call the time zone, or if you're a football fan, in what I believe is the red zone of prophecy. I believe that we are right in those moments that are prophetically talked about in the, by Jesus and by uh, the, the teachers of the New Testament as being a time, and I believe that we are watching things come, come into place. I think that we are seeing things begin to fall into place. They're not falling apart. They literally are falling into place. But, in, uh, but with that, there's a sense of moral confusion. There's a sense of, uh, you know, just all kinds of political uncertainty. There's all this uh, moral uncertainty. I mean, which bathroom do you use? I mean, come on. It's, it's like we, we have literally lost uh, the, the central bearing of what they used to call the moral center uh, in America and around the world as people just kind of fall all over themselves to be politically correct or to try to appease a situation or a group of people that they believe are politically correct. Now all of this is happening not by accident. It's not something that's just kind of came up out of nowhere. It's been building and it's been building and it's been building. And this isn't a message on the end times. It really isn't. That's not my job today. But what I want to share with you this morning is people who are selected to live in this particular time. I believe that God matches the people in the kingdom of God with the time frame in which they live. I really believe that. I believe that you and I have been specifically selected to live at this particular time. You might say to yourself, well, I'm just alive. I'm just surviving. And, and that you may feel that way. But I believe, and I'm going to share this real quick. My wife wants to know, are you going to go long this morning? I, I, I just want to share what God has laid on my heart because I think that we are living in a crisis zone. We're living where things are kind of turning back and forth. And it seems like the church kind of is being downplayed as a major your moral influence and I think that is probably wrong in fact I know it's wrong and I when I say the church I'm talking about men and women who belong to Jesus Christ I'm not talking about the institution of the church I'm talking about the body of Christ because we're the body of Christ where men and women truly are in the body of Christ and live out the teachings of Jesus they are strong against morality uh, that is that is unscriptural they are strong against every other kind of darkness that there is. And our world has a lot of spiritual confusion and nuttiness. And I like what Bill Foth used to say, Bob Foth used to say, he said, we just have a spirit of weirdness. <laughs> and it's out there. And I believe you and I have been chosen. I'm not just saying that because I want to, you know, I want to get any on your good side. I believe whether it's this church or any other church that believes and serves Jesus Christ and acknowledge him and honors him, you've been chosen to live in this time. You've been handpicked for this moment. If you watch football, you know that when you get into the red zone, the teams put in their best players. The team driving for the football, for the, for the goal line, and the team defending the goal line. They put in their best players. I believe the church is coming to that particular point. Why? Here's why. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to look down to the verses that I've just read to you. And it's from John chapter 14. And listen to what Jesus says. And he starts out with something that is first theologically very difficult for the disciples to understand. And they've been struggling with this all along. Believe me when I say, he said to them, believe me when I say, tell you. And then he goes on to talk about the relationship between himself and the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And they're saying, huh? They didn't get it. Because it's a principle so, so unique to their Jewish minds. For years they have been trained about the sovereignty of God, about the singleness of God, and now sitting around their campfire, sitting with them at the table, is a human being talking to them in human words, with human flesh, and out of his mouth he's been putting in food, and now out of his mouth they're coming these words, I am the Father, the Father's in me and I am in the Father. And they're looking at him and saying, well, you're just kind of, you're messing with my Jewish mind thought here. I mean, just, I can't get this. And so Jesus is not pushing that. He tells them that. He is training them in that because it will be necessary for them to understand, to break out of that mindset that they've had. They need to understand that God has come in the flesh. And God come in the flesh is what Jesus is all about. 
God walking among his people in the flesh is what is, this is all about. But listen to it. He's not going to ask them, okay, guys, do you get that? There's going to be a test. And if you don't understand and can't explain it theologically, you fail the course. That's not what he's saying to them. He's telling them a, a fact, a truth that is central to what will happen next with them. And, but then he goes on to say, he said, believe in me that when I say that the Father, that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, which is confusing to some and today he's still confusing to many people. But then he breaks it down to human level. He says, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. I don't want to pause here, but there's three things I want to talk to you about. Because what I want to talk to you about real quick, even greater things. These are the words of Jesus, even greater things. I think in this day, with this hour, with what's going on, God has called you and me, the church of Jesus Christ, to do even greater things. I think the exploits of this generation, the exploits of people living in this time zone, are, going, are, are, are so needed and they're so expected by God that God is, is literally creating a, an atmosphere in which People who believe will be able to do greater things in his name. But here's the beginning point. He says, and I love this, and it's nighttime, and it's probably about 1130 at night now as the night drags on into the Passover night. And they're sitting in that Passover table, and then they're looking, and, I, and Jesus is talking to them. And in my mind, I think Jesus is sitting near a window. This is just me. It's not in here. It's just me. Because Jesus is trying to communicate with the disciples that what they've been doing is very meaningful, very powerful. The ministry that they've been involved in for three and a half years. And then Jesus said these words, and listen carefully, or at least believe in the evidence. And to me, I just think that Jesus might be kind of just, he just kind of just sweeped his hand over the city of Jerusalem out that open window and said, the evidence, it's out there. The man we he that I healed yesterday, the woman who can see, the lady who can stand and walk, the little child that was raised from the dead, the evidence. And this evidentiary process that Jesus has been creating, that he is God and that God is walking among his people. This is an incredible, it is fascinating to look at. And Jesus just says that evidence, the land is full, the church is full of the evidence that he is who he says he is. And that's all he's trying to say to them. Believe the evidence. I am who I say I am. Believe it. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe the, the teachings that you don't understand, at least believe the evidence born out of this. Those of you who are healed this morning, when you go late and you say to somebody, I was hurting, I went to church, they prayed for me, and I was healed, you are living evidence that God is still in the world, still doing what he said he would do. And that's amazing, and that's, cri that's the criteria for believing and being in this day, yes. is to be able to say to people, look at the evidence yes. of God among us. Yes. But then he goes on. The first thing that he wants them to, to do, and I'm going to break it down in three things, because it's a, it's a sermon. It's got to have three points. That's all there is to it, okay? He's leaving. And he says to them, this is my ministry. And he, he kind of reviews for them, if you will. Look at the things that we have done. Look at the trail of evidence all the way since the marriage feast at Cana. Look at the evidence. Everything that we've left in play. All the lives that have been changed. All the bodies that have been healed. All the people who have been delivered from demonic oppression. It's evidence that God, because nobody could do. It's the words of the Pharisee who came to says, no man can do what you do unless God is with him. And later the people in the book of Mark would say, they begin to say to one another, God has walked among his people. God is here. God is here. And it's not just God is here theologically. It's not just God is here because his name is Emmanuel. It's God is here because he has left a trail of evidence about his concern, about his compassion, about how much he cares. This is his ministry. This is his heartbeat. This is why he puts on his Nikes in the morning. This is why he slips on his t-shirt to go out and do the ministry to which he's been called. And he's just saying, let me, let me read down what he says to them. He says, the miracles, the compassion. If you've got your Bible open, he said, I tell you the truth, anyone who, and well, let me, I'm going to skip most of that. I want to go down into these verses here because I think there's something interesting in here. In verse 11, he says, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And then he goes on to say, this is what I am. And, and hold on to that, okay? 
Because the next thing he says is so primary to everything that we believe. If you've got your Bible, I want you to look at verse 12, if you will. His ministry is our ministry. It's not just, well, we can look back and look at, well, wasn't Jesus cool? Everybody loves Jesus. Hey, why wouldn't they? Free food, free medical care. You I mean, everybody loves Jesus. Okay, but this is not just Jesus going for man of the year. This is not Jesus just trying to get a place on the popularity list. This is God moving among his people, caring about what hurts them, hurts him. Loving them because he loves them. Compassion about them because he's a compassionate God. And this is what he says in verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me, they will do the works that I have been doing. And the disciples kind of look around the room and they say, oh, that's why we're here. That's why you've called us to continue your work, to take what you have done so far and to continue pressing it out into new venues, new lives, new people, new places. So not only does he have a ministry, but his ministry is invested within us. And that ministry is something that each and every one of us carry out of here on a Sunday morning it's what we carry out of here. It's not just what we've learned. It's not just the, what we have accumulated. It's not just what we've stored up in the memory banks. You know, you've got a computer and you go into the memory and you can see all this stuff. He didn't just give this to you so you could understand, oh, God can heal. And he's like good and everything. It's God working through you. Whoever, listen to it, it says, whoever believes in me, and if you believe in him, you will do the works that he is doing, that he has done. Yes. Now hold on to this because this is a truth. This is not just a truth though, it's something that he will hold us responsible for. It is something that he, sometimes people say, I have a ministry. I don't know if you know this or not, but I have a ministry. I'm in charge of the yoga club at my church and I have a ministry. And in this ministry, you know, I have a certain amount of, I have a certain amount of elevation. I have a certain amount of respect that comes with this. That's nothing of the ideas that God communicates through ministry. It is people touching the lives of other people. It is people coming into the lives of people hurting and saying to them, this is how much God cares about you. And it doesn't have to be the people on the platform, and it doesn't have to be the people who hand out, who are the servants within the church. It's every human being that has been transformed, been touched, been, if you will, regenerated by the power of God's love, telling others and showing others. I was talking to an elder gentleman. He says, you know, he says, I believe the greatest revival the world will ever see is occurring right now in, in, under, in ways that we can't even begin to see. He says, but I really believe, he says, here's the difference. In the old revival style, in the old revival style, we looked for the gifts of the Spirit to be within operation within, the, within our spiritual gatherings and meetings, which is cool. Let's do that. He says, but we see evidence that in the last days, as God begins to lift his people, this army that, God, that our pastor was talking about this morning, it will be men and women operating within the gifts of the Spirit outside the church in the lives of unbelievers, which will be more profound than just keeping it locked up in a building. When someone, would give us, when someone would give a spiritual message, when someone would have a word of knowledge, when someone would give a prophecy, when someone within the church would say, Alleluia, and we grab onto it and we say, this is ours. You can't have it. This is mine. I got this. I got this. But in what God believe, what, God, what, what we believe God is saying to the church now is these words. His ministry did not happen within the synagogue. In fact, there were so many times when he was kicked out of the synagogue, he, he probably had on his, on, his, on, on his back pocket, kick here, you know, when he enters the synagogue. Kick me out here. He was not welcome because his message in the synagogue was looked upon as being too radical, too out of the box. And that's not what God wants from us. He doesn't want us to be out of the box. He doesn't want us to be Mr. and Mrs. Weirdness. He wants us to move in the compassion of ministry and gifts of the Spirit, but operating to people who desperately need them. Maybe a word to someone. Maybe a word to someone who's hurting. Maybe to your neighbor. These are where the spiritual gifts 
can have the greatest impact. We want them happening within the body. We want to see them. We want to see gifts. As we, Carol and I visit probably 100 churches a year. We're real, real good at church hopping. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes we'll go into churches and pastors is the honest truth. And I'm, I'm not, this is just an observation and it's not a criticism. But pastors will say to us, we're not a traditional uh, Pentecostal church. So don't expect Pentecostal stuff to happen. In other words, we don't do what the Bible commands us to do. But that's okay. That's between them and whatever their church is doing, wherever their church is at. But I always think... I always think that these are basically limiting the power of the Holy Spirit to be what he wants to be to his people when we say, well, we don't do that here. We used to do that here, but we had to stop because Sister Papoofnik got in trouble over there. <laughs> and I don't think that's the reason God limits that. I believe that he wants to release these things, not simply so that we can say, we had gifts. You guys don't have them. We have them. I don't think that's what he's trying to say. He says, this is whoever believes in me will do the works that I am doing. So the light that's shining on you in the last day, the real light that's shining on you as a believer in the last day, examines, are you doing the works of him who sent you? Are you doing the works? If you believe in him, and how many believe in him? He who believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. You will be the continuation of a, of a dynamic revolution of spiritual power as you move forward and you do the works. And doing the works might begin with cooking the next door neighbor a casserole, cutting their grass, holding their mail, or it might mean praying with someone in line at the supermarket. Or it might mean giving up your place so that they can see Christ in you. It might mean a dozen things when the Holy Spirit prompts you and says, Now, do this, and you will bring glory to the Father. So do the works that he's been doing. That's your command. That is your calling. That is what you will be held responsible for. They asked Billy Graham one time, they told him, Billy, Mr. Graham, you are one of the most talented individuals in the ministry we've ever seen. And he said something that remains with me to this day. He says, every gift, every talent is a liability for which I will give an account. Every ministry that we've been called to, everything that we've been called to do, everything that you and I have been called to do, one day we will give an account they're not assets to be enjoyed, but liabilities to be given account for. So number one, there's evidence. He left evidence that he had, was working. Number two, he has a ministry that he wants you and me to carry on in his name. But if you have your Bible, I want you to look at the last part of chapter, at verse 12. It says, and they will. Those who believe in me will do the works that I've been doing. Okay, that's, a, that's the standard. That's where it begins. But listen to this next part of the verse. They will do, and here's those three words. I want you to say them with me. Now, you might have a Greek Bible, or you might have a, you know, whatever kind of Bible. But I want you to say these words with me. Three little words. Even greater things. Say it out loud. Even greater things. Now, I'm not going to break that down like they did in English class, okay? I think you fully understand what he's saying here. You will do my works. You'll be do what I've been doing, but you're going to do them in a greater way. Why? Because the world in which you live is a greater spiritual challenge than it's ever been before. So the quality of the worker has to reach up and be greater or greater than the power that it's being called to take on. So we're not called just to carry out his ministry. That's number one. That's primary. But listen to this. They will do even greater things. Why? Because I'm going to be with the Father. And verse 13, look at verse 13. You got it? Now, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, okay, would you take out your pen, give it a click, drop it in the ink well, whatever it is you do. And I want you to underline this next verse. Because this is important. This is the reason why you do what you do. Now, I've said this before, but I'll keep saying it. If you're not in the habit of underlining in your Bible, reach over and underline in your neighbor's Bible. because <laughs> It's good stuff right here. Somebody needs to take this one home. Say, here, take this home, read it. But listen, I will do whatever you ask 
I will do whatever you ask in my name. And here's the reason. Not so that you can have a nicer car than your neighbor. Not so that you can live in the nicest house in the neighborhood. Not so that you can look down on your friends for not having as good a faith as you have. But so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There is a potential in that that we have yet to tap into within the church. I was telling your pastor last night when we had a, I mean, uh, Mickey and, and, and uh, what's his name again? <laughs> Dave. Uh, like I said, we go to 100 churches a year. They all, you know, you know how these are. You know, pastors all look alike. But anyway, I was telling you, I was in a church. I was in a church a few years back. And I was getting ready to, I was getting ready to speak. And it was, a, it was in the Portland area. It was Oregon, so you know how they are. But uh, I'm getting ready to speak. And they had a banner across the front and it said we are a spirit-led community now I understand what they're saying there and, and and trust me these are great people and I believe they're living up to the to that but I was looking at that and here's what I told your pastor last night that some something stuck in my mind and I kind of looked around about 300 people there that morning men and women boys and girls and it suddenly dawned on me there are 300 choice servants of the Lord in this community. Here in Portland, where they are hurting desperately, if these 300 choice servants of the Lord who are sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit will simply do what he's called them to do, this entire quadrant of the city will be shaken with the renown of what God has done. And the same is true here this morning in Walla Walla. If you will simply do what the Holy Spirit will lead you to do this week. If you will take the words that you are learning. If you will take what you saw happening here. The worship that you participated in here today. And you will let that sensitize your heart to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And then flow into wherever and whatever he's calling you to do. You will have an impact. I've been in churches that were thousands upon thousands of people. And then, since then, my thought has been, if every one of these took the truth they learned and just simply lived it out this week, put it into action, the difference that would be made by next Sunday would be profound. Amen? Well, I guess. I don't know. Sounds like, you know. Well, I want you to do two things with me. First of all, I want you to say amen. Can you... Is that all they got? Is that it? There you go. Okay. But the next thing I want you, let's give the Lord appreciation. Because I believe, and I'm sure you know this as well, the power of Pentecost is not just an internal combustion engine. It works best in external places. It works best when it's ministering in the lives of people. But God doesn't want you to run up to someone and start slapping on the forehead and spitting on them, you know. <laughs> but perhaps maybe he wants you with a spirit-led demeanor. With a sensitivity to who they are and the crisis and the culture which they find themselves in. You can be perfectly attuned to what the Holy Spirit would say to them. So can I say just two words to you? Ready? Do it. Just do it. If somebody told me, he said, man, I don't, believe I, I don't believe I flow in that kind of ministry. Baloney. I know that's a spiritual word, but, you know, really, truthfully, greater things occur when men and women, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not, and desensitized to whatever they think might be shame, suddenly begin just simply speaking the word of God, begin doing the word of God, begin being sensitive to the word of God. The Holy Spirit will not allow you to be insensitive to their need, their culture, or wherever they are at that moment. He will use you perfectly just like it did when he touched your life. I know people, and you know people, and I was raised in the Southern Pentecostal Church, and we just loved to spit on each other, and we loved to shake each other, you know. And that, and I, I, sorry, I, I'm not, I'm not, I am, again, I'm not judging. I'm just simply saying, I'm just simply saying as an observation, that was weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> but on the other hand, at least there was a willingness 
to move out into the gifts, to the work that he's called us to do. So number one, he has a ministry, and it was evidence all over the place that his ministry was exactly what it said it was. Secondly, his ministry is our ministry, and he has put at our disposal, listen to this, and a lot of people say, well, I don't think it really means that. Whatever I, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Oh, let's go on. We don't even have time for that one. In other words, he's saying, I will put at your disposal all of the resources of heaven. Say that with me. I will put at your disposal. I will put at your disposal all of the resources of my Father. That's his promise to you. I was preaching on prayer some time ago. Oh, we are over time, and so you know, hang on. But listen to this. We were in a church sometime, and I was preaching on prayer. And it suddenly dawned on me what we were doing. We were, I was teaching on the words of Jesus, and we asked whatever you will, and it shall be done. And it suddenly dawned on me. He says, what, and he teaches them to ask, seek, and knock. And I suddenly, something began to, something began to stir inside of me, like you said a while ago. And here's what it was. The guy who's going to answer the prayer is telling me how to pray. The guy who is going to be picking up the receiver when I say, Father in heaven, when I pray in Jesus' name, he's the guy who's telling me what to ask and how to ask. And someone said to me, well, I don't think it quite works that way. I think there's some Greek stuff in there that kind of, you know, kind of devalues the, the meaning of the scripture. And, I, and I, I'm true. I, I'm sure there are certain uh, phrases and intentions within the parameters of that word that kind of, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't think that's what it is. I think the guy who answers the phone in heaven is telling us, first of all, to call. And then he's telling us how to pray. Now, in my office, like in your pastor's office, I've got books on prayer. And I've got all kinds of books on prayer, how to pray, how to pray for one hour, how to pray for 15 minutes, who to pray for, what to pray for. And I love these guys, and I love their intake on prayer. And, I, and, I've, and I've gained a lot from it. I have, I'm not making fun. But I'm saying the one guy who really knows how to pray is telling me this is how to pray. And by the way, I'll answer the phone when you pray. Quick synopsis and then we're done. You listening? Here we are. I like to play golf every once in a while. I'm not very good. Can you say amen? <laughs> you know. Would you rather take lessons from a guy who admits that he's not very good? Or from somebody who's won several PGA titles? You say, like, what's up with that? I mean, come on. There are not that many crazy people in the house. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You would rather take... You would rather take all the information that this person who has excelled in it than someone who's barely playing the game. And yet we will line up to buy books and we will stand in line to get the next and the latest idea. Well, all the time the word of Jesus is simply ask. Whatever you ask. Well, let's, let me read it to you one more time so we're getting this right because this is some big stuff right here. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. And here's the reason why, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And here's, what I, and, 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 and here's what I want to talk to you about in conclusion. This is going to take just a moment. I want you to listen carefully. Here is the dynamic. We live in a kind of crazy, and, and I'm sorry, but there's no other way. We're, we're, we're messed up. I'm kidding you. I saw a little thing the other day and says, okay, this is funny. Now send in the real presidential candidates. Okay, it's been funny. We enjoyed the joke, and it, it, it sounds funny, but there's a real concern. A con, uh, there's, a, there's a real sense of uneasiness about where our country is headed, where we headed spiritually, where we headed morally, where we headed economically. And you're not. We're not the only ones. We've traveled in Europe. We've been in Europe. We've heard what they had to say. We were in, uh, we were back in in Latvia not long ago, and out in front of us, they told us don't go out in the street because there's a mass demonstration. The mass demonstration was a mass demonstration by the people of, of Latvia telling the Jews to leave and get out of their country. And this is happening in country after country. And there's a rise of hatred on just everywhere you go. I mean, first there's a rise of, uh, of radical Muslim, and on the other hand, there's a, radical, there's a rise of radical, you know, homeland defense, and it's going to clash and it's going to burn. 
But here's the, de here's the deal. In the midst of all this swirling confrontation, in the midst of this coming conflagulation, God has created and placed within it just the right people. His church. Men and women who are basically trained to do greater things. There is no building in this city. There's no city that there, there's nowhere in the world that can contain what God wants to do in this city. It's not about building. That's what I love about your pastor. He doesn't talk about building the church. He doesn't talk about adding people to the pews. But what, it, what, what really impresses my heart is just the, the, the desire to see the kingdom enlarged in this city. But, but here is, and, and I've got 30 seconds, okay? Are you, are you timing me down? Here we go. Here is the great dynamic of this age. That men and women living in this culture, seeing the situations in which it, they have a tendency to want to run away and hide from it. I was talking to a pastor the other day. He's an older pastor. And he's been in the, he's been in the ministry for over 50 years. And he was, we're driving along. And he's saying, he says, my retirement comes up uh, next year. And he says, I can't wait. I want, to get out of the, I want to get out of the struggle. I want to get out of the struggle. And that would be easy to emulate in almost every life. It'd be easier to close our doors on a Monday night and watch what's going on in the tube. It would be easier to shut ourselves away and not have to deal with the, with the dirty work of sinners who have those habits. But even greater things, the lives of people change because you and you and you and all the other rest of us began to move in the impulse of the power of the Holy Spirit doing, say it with me, even greater things. Father, we thank you for this church. And this is not a rah-rah speech. This is not a speech to make people enthusiastic and make them run out of here and start distributing tracts in the neighborhood. It's a call. It's a call to be men and women who emulate in their own lives the ministry of Jesus. Who spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-directed people who know how to impact communities by their sensitivity to the Holy Spirit would you lay your hand on your heart for just a moment? If you're here today and you belong to Jesus Christ. Just a moment. No one's looking and there's, there's no magic thing in this. It's just a kind of a symbolic thing. For a moment. And I know you, you know all about you. I know all about me. And you know all about you. But here's the deal. You ready for the dealio? Here it is. Okay? Are you listening? Here it is. As the pastor pointed out a while ago, and I believe that was a word from the Lord, we do not serve him out of obligation. We do not carry out his ministry under duress. We do what he's called us to do because we love him and we love the people around us. Lord, our heart is, over, our, our heart is open. Our hand is over our heart. This is where we live. And something inside of us is crying out. Something inside of us. Even greater things. In this darkness that we call a world. That's where people try to continue to live a normal life. When everything is falling out of place. You've called us to do even greater things. So Father right now to every honest heart. May, you, may they as spirit directed people. Begin to have an impact each and every step of the week ahead of them. May they say the right word. May they do the right thing. May they act in the right way that will bring glory to the Father. And Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you pro provide for them the spiritual resources, whatever they need to accomplish your ministry in their lives. And we're going to give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me for just a moment? 
There's an old song we used to sing, and I, and I just sense that where you're standing right now, without, without making movement or without making some, just an old song we used to simply say, and we'll give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his love and tell of his love we'll give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his wonderful love sing it again would you we'll give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his love and tell of his love we'll give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his wonderful love now, would you reach over and put your hand on the shoulder of the person beside you if they are comfortable with that? If they're not, don't do it. Okay? We're going to pray for one another right now. I know it would be great to have a powerful altar meeting. But I just sense the Lord wants us outwardly focused this morning. So here's the prayer. Are you ready? Father, in the name of Jesus, empower this person for spirit-directed ministry. Empower this person for spirit-released ministry in the name of Jesus. May they touch just one life with the power and the anointing of spirit-directed ministry in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray for them right now. Pray out loud for them right now. Pray out loud. Say their name. Pray for them right now. God, bring into their lives one person, and may they be powerfully impactful to that one person. Father, in the name of Jesus, may they touch one life in a positive way, in a culturally effective way, a sensitive to the needs of people way. And we're going to give you the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. Would you give him the appropriate response? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's good, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Well, I want to invite the prayer teams to just come forward this morning. And if you uh, have a, a prayer need, if you have something that you'd like someone to agree with you about in prayer, then there will be people up here that can uh, pray with you. I know they're coming. There's one. <laughs> come forth in Jesus' name. And if you, if you have a need, please come up and, and get some prayer. Other than that, have an awesome Mother's Day. We celebrate you. Enjoy it. Enjoy this beautiful day. God bless you, saints.